Well, good day, my friends. It's your old pal, Jordan the Lion, your old pal, Jaw, over here. And today we are in Nashville, Tennessee, and we are going to go to Spring Hill Cemetery. There are countless country legends buried there, and a lot of them have really cool headstones with a lot of their accomplishments on there. So I wanted to take you over there and show you if you've never been there. Days with Jordan the Lion and this guy begins right now. When I'm doing introductions in the vlogs and I say this guy, I usually mean you. We have arrived, Spring Hill Cemetery. Well, pretty much as soon as you enter, you have, very fittingly, Roy Acuff. Probably one of the most important men in Nashville history. As Waylon Jennings used to say, the only man in Nashville that you called Mr. because, well, because he earned it. His whole family is here. You can see he's got family members over here. His father, mother, Roy is down here. staple of the Grand Ole Opry. He was the first man inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. He had an interesting story because when he was young he excelled at sports and he wanted to be a baseball player. He even played on a semi-pro baseball team when he got out of high school and um, was looking at being scouted. He was supposed to do a tryout for the New York Giants at the time and he ended up getting sunstroke one day. And he went out to play again and tried it about three or four times, he said, and every time he went out, he ended up getting sunstroke. So he realized that he was not meant to make his life as a baseball player. So he ended up falling into a deep depression and started learning how to play the fiddle and just obsessed over the fiddle and ended up within a few short years, being a staple of the Grand Ole Opry. It's his son. Now Roy was called Mr. because, see, not only was he a superstar with Wabash Cannonball, but he had also started a publishing company, Acuff Rose Publishing, and they became a power, power publisher. They ended up having Hank Williams song rights, now they're, uh, I think they're part of Sony. But yeah, he was just a big deal in this town and he owned a lot of property. And he owned a building down on Musicians Row, or Music Row, and he had his own museum in there, the Roy Acuff Museum. Well, on the second floor, he ended up letting George Jones move his saloon into there. And at one point, the, uh, the plumbing couldn't take everything that was going on up at the saloon, all the people that were coming there and everything. And the pipes burst and everything flooded. And Roy Acuff kicked George Jones' saloon out of the building. And they said, Roy, you're one of our number one customers. You're here every night. How can you kick us out? And he said, I can't have turds floating in my exhibits. <laughs> Now he also ran for, I believe, governor of Tennessee, Republican governor of Tennessee. Guy was a yo-yo fanatic, he had a collection of yo-yos and was always trying to teach people the yo-yo. Tried to teach Richard Nixon while he was going through Watergate how to play the, how to use a yo-yo to take his mind off of everything. Just a real colorful, interesting guy. And like I said, the, the first person inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame. Now, if you go beyond Roy and you keep going back, you have another extremely well-known musician, Earl Scruggs, right back here. Thank you. 
some memorable moments out of his life playing the banjo. Another member of the Grand Ole Opry, you can see they've got the Ryman Auditorium right there. And his wife, Louise. Earl Scruggs, most influential, most imitated banjo player in the world. December 8th, 1945, he joined Bill Monroe's band and helped give birth to Bluegrass when he introduced his innovative and exciting three-finger style of playing five-string banjo on the Grand Ole Opry. Very cool. Before Earl's Opry debut, five-string banjos had become widely thought of as stage props used only by comedians playing rowdy old-time styles. Earl's re refined musicianship electrified audiences and banjo sales skyrocketed. His way of picking became known around the world as the Scrugg style. Early 1948, Earl and Lester Flat formed a band that Earl's loving wife Louise began managing in 1955. Flat and Scruggs became one of the most successful country music acts of the era. In 1962, Flatt and Scruggs provided the banjo-driven music for the theme song of the hit TV series The Beverly Hillbillies. The 1967 film Bonnie and Clyde features their 1949 recording of Earl's composition, Foggy Mountain Breakdown, which I love. I let, that's one of my favorite songs. Flatt and Scruggs split up in 69, and Earl found many new fans when he bridged generations and musical genres by forming the Earl Scruggs Review with sons Gary and Randy. It was a pioneering band in merging country and bluegrass sounds with elements from rock music. Youngest son, Steve, also became a musician and joined the, re the review. In his latter years, Earl's musical journey continued with his family and friends band. Standing ovations awaited him at every turn, and Earl remained the mo modest and unpretentious man he had always been throughout his legendary career. Earl Scruggs, who was also a gifted guitarist, was a true icon in the music world and an inspiration to countless musicians. Though his strings are now silent, echoes of his sparkling scrug style sound will linger in the air forever. I just did that off the top of my head. I'm kidding. That's a great memorial for anyone that doesn't know about him. And then his wife, Louise Scruggs, first female artist manager and booking agent in the history of country music. She grew up as an only child on a farm in Lebanon, Tennessee at the age of seven. She asked for and received a toy typewriter and a small desk for Christmas, <laughs> and her interest in the business world grew. In December of 1946, Louise attended Grand Ole Opry, the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, and met Earl Scruggs. They married in April of 1948. Soon after, Earl and guitarist Lester Flatt formed their musical partnership. Luis began booking concerts for Flatt & Scruggs and soon became their manager in an era when the music business was very much a man's world. Her managerial vision stayed strong and focused and the band's popularity kept rising. Luis's busy workload also included promo, publishing, and bookkeeping duties for the duo. When Flatt & Scruggs disbanded in 1969, Luis continued to manage Earl's iconic career until her passing. In an interview in 2005, Earl spoke of Luis and said, I didn't get where I went just on talent. What talent I had would never have peaked without her. She helped shape music up as, as a business instead of just people out picking and grinning. 2007 Country Music Hall of Fame and Museum hosted its first annual Luis Scruggs Memorial Forum, which was created to honor music industry leaders exemplifying the high business standards set by Luis during her long, illustrious career. She was a very devoted, loving wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. And then this is the opposite side. They did both sides. <laughs> what a dedication. Has all of their awards on there. As well as his compositions. Foggy Mountain Breakdown and Luis's awards. Now, if we leave the Scruggs and we turn around, Roy Acuff is right over here, and we're gonna go over to Jimmy Martin, who is just right here. We have Jimmy Martin, self-described poor boy from Sneedville, Tennessee, 
In references to his early years, Jimmy was dubbed the king of bluegrass music during the 1970s. Major force in defining and establishing the music's so-called high lonesome sound. He began as lead singer guitarist with the Bluegrass Boys in October of 1949. In 1955, he formed his Sunny Mountain Boys and became a headline artist on both the Louisiana Hayride in Shreveport and the WWVA Wheeling Jamboree. Among other labels, Jimmy Martin recorded 138 titles for a major record company, many of which including Ocean of Diamonds, Sulfurny, Widowmaker, and Sunny Side of the Mountain did well in the country music charts of the 1950s through 70s. Virtually all of the songs he popularized came to be regarded as standards. A colorful and consummate entertainer and musician, Jimmy Martin produced profound and endearing influences on the idiom during its critical formative years and throughout the remainder of bluegrass music's first half century. 1995 inductee into the Bluegrass Hall of Fame, 1969 into Walkway of the Stars, into the Country Music Hall of Fame, I think that was the same year that Acuff got in, and Marianne Garrison. It was a dear friend of Jimmy's who loved and cared for his four children when they were small. Timmy, Ray, Lisa, and Buddy Lee. Shake hands with mother and daddy again. Will the circle be unbroken? That's what Kenny Rogers has on his headstone, on his monument. Now sings in heaven. Take a look at that guy. Now let me show you, or tell you about who this is and what this is. You can see that he is part of the Odom family plot. And the Odom family is buried down here. They started a company and this guy was their little mascot. Odom's Tennessee Pride. 1943 with a $1,000 loan. Douglas Odom Sr. And his wife, Louise Odom, converted a chicken house in Madison, Tennessee into a four hog a day meat grinding sausage business. Son Doug Jr. remembers helping to mix and blend the sausage with the original secret family recipe and spices into the finest quality of fresh pork. The sausage was packed in cloth bags and stamped with Tennessee pride, which Louise had sewn by hand, with the back seat removed from the 34 Chevy four-door sedan. There's Doug Sr. There's their logo. Doug, and, Doug Jr. and Richard loaded the orders and headed out to the groceries of Nashville. The backseat was replaced to go to church on Sundays. <laughs> the Odoms had twin daughters, Judy and June, whose small helps help turn the cloth bags right inside out. While sitting at the table one day, Judy drew a picture for her dad of a strolling, pole-toting country boy, the family never dreamed of what this icon would become to symbolize. Tennessee Pride became a sponsor of the Grand Ole Opry 1956. The farm boy remained as a huge backdrop for the Opry stage until 1982, when it came down to be awarded in the souvenir portions to donors of the Hank Snow Foundation for Abused Children. Imagine yesteryear on a Friday or Saturday night broadcast of Opry Music hearing a familiar slogan, Take home a package of Tennessee Pride. For three generations, nearly 70 years, the Odom family provided sausage for Tennessee and countless families across America and beyond. Tennessee Pride Country Sausage became a household name and can still be purchased in stores and institutions throughout the United States. Now we're going to go just down the road from the Odoms. See Hank Snow. Now right over here you can see the headstone for the great Hank Snow. It says still moving on. That was his hit song. His house is virtually untouched to this day. The same way it was when he was alive and I got to stay in it. It's an Airbnb. I got to stay in it. It's so cool because he originally 
was was almost Elvis's manager until the colonel cut him out. But Hank went on to have an amazing career. It's his wife Minnie. And had a hit song was still moving on. In fact, when he was going to buy his house, he was worried that he wouldn't be able to afford it. And his friend said, you know what? You're a good songwriter. Go ahead and buy it. You'll have a hit. If you buy it, you'll have a hit. Well, he bought it. And within a year, he had still moving on as a hit. And it paid off the whole house. <laughs> so when you go by the house, the gate, the front of the house has a, uh, a train moving on. Very cool. Hank Snow had countless hits and made records for decades and decades. Really interesting guy. And he would always take the album covers on his property. So if you go and stay there, you can match up a lot of the album covers. What's interesting though, is that I found out afterward that he, well, I knew when he, when I was there, somebody had told me that he liked to paint. I didn't think much of it beyond that. And then when I was watching a documentary about Bob Ross, it turns out that Hank Snow had been inspired by Bob Ross and had taken the Bob Ross class with Bob and ended up becoming a pretty good painter. So I would love to get one of Hank Snow's paintings if I could find one, but he and Bob Ross became very good friends, very close friends. Another member of the Country Music Hall of Fame. We're continuing on a little further down from Roy and Earl. The one over here that says right, don't be confused, that's Kitty Wells. Her headstone, United in Marriage and Music. You can see her married name Wright. Her and her husband here. And then her name on the guitar right over here. Then on the bottom it says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. Then her husband, Johnny Wright, whose name is also there on the guitar. Very wonderful, gigantic headstone that you can see as soon as you come into the cemetery. Pillars, both pillars have those angels. Kitty and Johnny were married in 1937. They used to perform the uh, Louisiana Hayride. Kitty was 14 when she started learning how to play guitar and had just an amazing voice. Was at one point coined the name the Queen of Country Music because she had. A 27 year career and she had 84 singles on the country charts 38 of them were top tens and right up there i guess you can see her crown she's a member of the country music hall of fame of course as is i believe johnny wright is as well well here we have billy and betty walker billy walker got his start in country music. He had won a talent show and got invited to go out to Clovis, New Mexico and just ended up loving it. Was inspired by Gene Autry and ended up even wearing in his, one of his early starts into music, he would be known as the tall Texan. He would wear like a Lone Ranger mask. But he, um, he ended up going into country music after a few years of trying to play rock and roll and ended up being one of the first people to record a Willie Nelson song when Willie Nelson was just a songwriter. He did a version of Funny How Time Slips Away and then he ended up having a number one hit with a song called Charlie's Shoes. Now what's interesting about Billy Walker is, is that on March 3rd, 1963, uh, Billy Walker received a call to return to Nashville. His fellow performer, Hawkshaw Hawkins gave Walker his commercial airline ticket and instead flew back to Tennessee on March 5th on a private plane, which ended up crashing with Patsy Cline. So how crazy is that, that he was given his ticket by someone who ended up passing away on that same flight. And then 
sadly at the end of his life, I mean, he was a mainstay for, I wanna say 60 years he was a member of the Grand Ole Opry. In 2006, he died in a car crash when his van he was driving back from Nashville after a performance veered off the interstate and his wife Betty, bassist Charlie, son Everett of the, Everett Lilly of the Lilly Brothers and guitarist Daniel Patton were also killed. What a sad ending. Let's see if there's anything, even says Tall Texan on his guitar. Nope, nothing on the other side. But the walkers are also buried next to the great Pete Drake right over here. For Pete's sake. The headstones of Rose Drake. Count the passage of time by friends, not years. Count your life by smiles, not tears. And Pete says his courage, his smile, his talent, and his love warms our hearts. Set that flower back up and that looks nice. I will sing a new song unto thee, O God. Upon an instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. Known as a really great producer, but really well known for his pedal steel plan. After Pete's first trip to Nashville at the age 18, he saw someone play the steel guitar and was obsessed and went home and immediately started working and built his own. And it wasn't very long after that that he was fronting his own band and he was known as one of Atlanta, Georgia's finest steel players. His band was the Sons of the South including Joe South, Roger Miller, Jerry Reed, and Jack Green. The, all those guys became basically what was known as like the Nashville Sound Session players, and Pete Drake was one of those. All those old um, RCA records that would have been produced by Chet Atkins, probably you've heard Pete Drake more times than you know. I had to drive around for a little while to find this one, but Shreveport native Floyd Kramer. Floyd is credited as becoming one of the people that created the Nashville sound that we were talking about earlier. He was a piano player, one of the great piano players from that time. He was a session player. He played for Roy Orbison, the Everly Brothers. Elvis Presley, Perry Como, Chet Atkins, Patsy Cline, and even had 50 solo albums. Became inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame 2003, and is also a member of the Country Music Hall of Fame and the Louisiana Music Hall of Fame, rightly so. Think about that, 50 solo records, plus playing with all those other famous musicians. Elvis, Roy Orbison, Patsy Cline. And the other side just says Kramer. Doesn't have uh, anything else. One's not a famous person that I know of, but very cool headstone. Now right over here, we have another famous grave. Very interesting. It looks like they put like a... I don't know if that's for people to sign or what that is in front of the grave. I like it though. Really great. I love you so very much, Michelle. So humble, never seeking spotlight, yet your beautiful music shines in our hearts forever. And there he is with Michelle. Fairly recent, passed away June 1st of 2020. There's a really cool picture of him. He's one of the Nashville cats, one of the legends. 50 years playing with the Opry. Jimmy Capps played for 
Kenny Rogers, George Strait, Johnny Cash made his debut in 1958 and is now a member of the Musicians Hall of Fame and the Country Music Hall of Fame. So cool. If you ever went to see any performances at the Opry, you probably saw him playing guitar. Well, my friends, I think that's gonna do it for us for today. We'll come back and do another video here some other time, because there are far too many famous country people and actually kind of uh, freak show people buried here as well. So there's a lot of people still left to see. Keith Whitley, Jan Roberts, Spec Rhodes. We'll come back and do those another time. I hope you all enjoyed this vlog. Thank you all for watching, and have a great night. Goodbye. Yeah.